That was really fantastic. Um, I think it's a yeah, good point, time to transition again. You know, we want these journal clubs to slowly go back to talking about non-COVID cardiac issues as well. Um, and we're really going here from um, something very um, high tech and important and current to what many of us uh, used to call the forgotten valves. Um, and the tricuspid valve really has been seen or thought of as the forgotten valve. Um, a lot of people would give Nina Braunwald some of the credit for that. Um, you know, as she wrote in circulation in 1967, that really you don't need to do anything for the tricuspid valve. Treat left-sided disease, uh, and that's all you need to do to get rid of functional tricuspid regurgitation. Um, maybe some diuretics. And so it's not surprising that for many years, you know, you'll find articles all over uh, journals talking about the forgotten valve about this valve that for many years we really haven't thought about um, or, or maybe haven't given a lot of attention to it because we felt we were not able to do uh, very much for uh, my husband. So, I like to start these talks when we talk about tricuspid is to really talk about who are the patients I'm talking about with severe tricuspid regurgitation who may need a transcatheter therapy. Um, and, so, and how common is it to have severe tricuspid regurgitation? I've often heard said uh, by very prominent cardiologists and cardiac surgeons that actually the you know, tricuspid regurgitation is not a common valvular disease. So here's some data. This is data on the left, is from the United States, which shows that there are probably about 1.6 million cases of tricuspid regurgitation, um, about a quarter of a million of new cases of, of TR. And what's, you know, one may question where these numbers come from and how they were calculated, um, because they are numbers that are calculated. But the one thing we do know for sure is that the number of annual surgeries for the tricuspid valve it really is minimal, um, probably, a, in the range of about 8,000. The data on the right is probably gives you a much better sense of the prevalence of tricuspid valve disease uh, in a general population. This is the Oxvalve study. Uh, it was done in Oxford, where they went out and just did um, transthoracic echoes on the population living in Oxford over 65 years of age. And they actually managed to categorize uh, 4,753 patients. And just looking at a healthy population living in Oxford, and maybe there's something peculiar about the water in Oxford, we don't know, um, you found that the prevalence of aortic stenosis was about 1.9%, uh, and it was newly diagnosed in 0.7%. The prevalence of mitral regurgitation, we all know mitral valve disease is much more common, was about 3.5%. But the prevalence of tricuspid regurgitation, and remember, this is moderate to severe tricuspid regurgitation, was actually higher than we see with the aortic valve disease. So they found a lot of TR in the population. And um, when you go and look a little bit in more detail, and this is an interesting study from Mayo, as you remember, as, and as you know, the Mayo has a very specific population around it uh, in Olmsted County that has been the subject of numerous studies. So there again, they did this community study, looked at 417 community residents uh, who were diagnosed with greater than uh, or equal to moderate TR. They found that all cause TR was about 0.55%, about one fourth of all left sided valvular disease. And as with other valvular diseases, it increases with age. When you looked at what the cause was of the TR, it was functional or secondary in about 95% of the population. Um, only in about 5% of patients with severe TR is it organic in nature. So most of of what we deal with and see with TR is functional or secondary to another cause. The most common cause being left-sided valvular heart disease in about half, followed by pulmonary hypertension about quarter, in a quarter, then left ventricular dysfunction, and then this entity of isolated uh, TR. Again, in a well-followed population around the Mayo Clinic, only about 2.6% of patients ever had tricuspid valve surgery during follow-up. Well, why are we talking about TR? Um, and why the sudden interest in TR? Well, I think because there's more and more data uh, that has come out showing us that TR actually is impactful as far as mortality and has a negative impact on mortality. The most um, 
well cited of these is a paper by Nath in 2004, uh, retrospective analysis looking at over 5,000 patients and showed that if you had severe TR, it worsens your mortality. But even if you have more moderate TR, you have a worse mortality. And really this analysis is done and adjusted for age, ejection fraction, RV size and function. So independent of those variables, TR is an independent predictor of mortality. Similarly, a study looking at a heart failure population showing that moderate or severe TR worsens your prognosis. And then again, looking, showing how severity is impactful. The more severe the TR, the worse your prognosis. It also is pretty clear that the, the cause of the TR has an impact on your mortality uh, and morbidity. So the worst type of TR to have as regards to mortality and heart failure hospitalization as well as atrial fibrillation is valvular TR or that related to left ventricular dysfunction. Um, congenital or primary forms of TR are, often have a much better prognosis and it seems that isolated TR, so not secondary to left-sided disease or pulmonary disease also has a better prognosis. So I think we all know um, surgery for the longest time uh, has been the gold standard uh, for tricuspid regurgitation. And there are many different techniques that surgeons have invented to correct annular dilatation. The one thing we've learned is that the annulus of the tricuspid valve dilates in a very specific way. Uh, what you see dilating, this is, oops, I'll just go back. This here is the septal leaflet. That's the anterior leaflet and the smaller posterior leaflet. And when the tricuspid annulus dilates, it's the free wall that dilates. And so it's the anterior and, po and posterior part of the annulus that dilates and gets larger. So many of the therapies um, done surgically are all about correcting that annular dilatation and particularly correcting this aspect, the anterior posterior aspect, which is where most of the dilatation goes. Uh, there have been a number of techniques over the years, the K technique, Clover, the Vega repair, but probably the most common technique is an incomplete ring or annuloplasty. Um, a lot of valve replacement also being done in many countries. So what are the data for surgery? I mean, many of us know that the historical data for surgery and particularly for redo surgery has not been fantastic. Um, but you know, we are now, we do have now modern surgical techniques. We have great ICU intensive care. So maybe results are better. So these are more um, current data on, on TR. And if you look at, the, this is a analysis done of the National Inpatient Sample Database in the United States, and two different analyses done from the same in-sample database. There's a lot of information here, and let me just summarize really the most important parts. The most important parts you'll see is that if you look at, in this gray line here, um, isolated TR and the numbers of isolated TR, it really is not changing. Uh, you'll see again over here that you know, the numbers of isolated TR over the years are not suddenly increasing. The other factor we realize that in the United States, probably about more than half of the cases of, of surgery for tricuspid valve disease when isolated is actually tricuspid valve replacement. Um, and only about 40% is tricuspid valve repair. But I guess the most concerning issue is probably this graph at the bottom, um, which looks at in-hospital mortality for patients undergoing tricuspid valve repair replacement. And if you look over a modern 10-year period, the mortality has not changed. The in-hospital mortality for repair has been in the range of about 8% and for replacement in about the range of about 10%. So in well-selected patients, and remember, you know, a surgeon to operate on a patient for isolated tricuspid valve disease will really choose a patient that is low risk for surgery. In a well-selected patient, the risk uh, is in the range of you know, in-hospital mortality of 8 to 10 percent. And why do these patients do badly? It's, and it's, I don't think it's related to bad surgeons or bad surgical technique. It's related very much to the patients and the fact that when these patients are referred for surgery or any intervention, it's often too late and we're intervening on them too late. They're older, uh, they more have more advanced disease with cirrhosis, with renal dysfunction, with low albumin levels and hemoglobin, and these patients then do very poorly. And it's been because we've seen that the numbers of TR patients are not decreasing, they're increasing. It is a social mortality and surgery 
has not had uh, the best of outcomes. And I think, once again, I don't think it's the surgical technique or the surgeon, but it's really related to the patients who are being referred to surgery that are too late. But seeing this unmet clinical need, what's happened uh, is there's been a flurry of devices in the transcatheter space. Um, and all these devices are devices designed um, to be done percutaneously, either via the femoral vein or via the jugular vein um, under echocardiographic guidance. And what all these techniques have tried to do uh, is try to reproduce surgical techniques. So you saw there were direct suture annuloplasty techniques. They're now transcatheter techniques trying to do that. The transcatheter techniques trying to recreate surgical annuloplasty or to try and improve coaptation or even to replace the valve percutaneously. Now, I don't want to go through too many of these techniques, but just give you a sense of what's happening in the world. If you look in the world, um, this is a trivalve registry that we've contributed to, and you see the number of cases are, have increased considerably. Um, and the most common technique being used out there is the mitral clip, just because it's been the, the one that uh, cardiologists are most familiar with and um, the one that's most uh, easily available. So there are over 2,000 cases done worldwide. Uh, here's an example of a patient with really severe TR uh, that we treated with two mitral clips. And you see the final result was really minimal TR. Um, there are a number of studies that have been performed and that are ongoing, really looking at tricuspid clipping. Um, and really, the data has shown that this technique is feasible. If you get a good result, so you get procedural success, you actually uh, have an impact possibly on mortality. Remember, this is retrospective data. We are waiting for prospective studies. Um, and that you can really reduce the TR and make patients feel better. In comparison to the mitral valve, all of us working in this field have been really surprised about how even modest reductions in tricuspid regurgitation make patients feel better. Uh, here's another device called the Pascal device, a little similar to what, you, what I just showed you with the mitral clip but done by another company. It also has the advantage that not only does it bring the leaflets together, but it's also a spacer in the middle of the valve to decrease the, the orifice. And again, with this device, you see important reductions in TR for percutaneously replaced device and a marked improvement in symptoms with 88% of patients in NYHA class one and two uh, at the end of the procedure. We can also reproduce percutaneously a surgical annuloplasty. Here, there, this is one of the devices that can do that. Uh, there are a number of devices now becoming available that will allow you to do that. And again, with this device, showing you mark improvements in EROA, NYHA class, KCCQ, and six minute walk. The latest frontier, and for me, one of the most exciting ones, because many of the patients that get referred to me for evaluation are often patients who have very severe TR with large coaptation gaps. And when a patient has a very large coaptation gap, probably larger than 10 millimeters, it's hard to grasp these leaflets with clips and Pascals and, and these leaflet devices. So now there are at least six or seven valves uh, that can be placed percutaneously that are becoming available for the tricuspid valve. As far as data is concerned, you know, do these therapies, are they impactful? You know, I want to remind you that there's actually, there actually are no randomized controlled trials comparing surgery to medical therapy for the tricuspid valve and for functional TR. We have performed, and you'll find the study in Jack, uh, we published this last year, um, a retrospective study where we took 472 patients treated with a transcatheter technique and propensity matched them with a large group of patients who were treated medically, uh, including a large group of patients who were treated at the Mayo Clinic. So we knew they were treated uh, extremely well. And when you propensity match those patients together and looked at the effect of transcatheter therapy, you do see the signal, and I'm gonna call it a signal and for now because it is retrospective, of a reduction in hospitalization for heart failure and possibly even a reduction in mortality. Uh, there are a number of ongoing retrospective studies that are trying to look, uh, sorry, randomized controlled trials that are trying to delineate this better. So when should you intervene or when should you refer a patient uh, for tricuspid valve uh, therapies? I think the earlier, the better. 
And the problem right now is we're realizing that there's a large heterogeneous group of patients with severe tricuspid regurgitation. And the patients that I often get referred to, uh, referred for therapies are these, this group here that are really end stage patients with very dilated right ventricles and poor RV function who potentially may not benefit from any therapy or any reduction TR. And we really need to move the bar earlier and earlier. Um, I'll just move forward one. Um, I do think you know, that these are a very complex group of patients. And in order to make these decisions, it really de requires a heart team. And that's kind of why we wanted to present this in our combined structural heart failure team, where structural heart and, and heart failure work together. We really, what we want to do is try and find patients where they are progressing, they are starting to become symptomatic, uh, remembering that the symptoms of severe TR can often be vague and not very obvious. You don't have to wait until the patient's JVP is above their ears or until they have four plus edema. Uh, we need to get them slightly earlier before they get to this point over here where there's really it will be a point of no return and they may not recover. Um, we need to get them here and then be able to offer them the right therapy, whether that be surgery or a transcatheter intervention. And really are there a number of variables that need to be taken into account when evaluating that. So maybe a couple of take home messages in a short period, I wanted to highlight the forgotten valve and how important it is uh, functional TR. It's there's really convincing data that's associated with a poor prognosis and the majority of patients are really not being offered any intervention. We need to think about transcatheter interventions and I think we need better patient awareness and physician awareness so that we can get these patients earlier. Um, I really want to then to end with, you know, it's nice to talk about these things in general, but really what is it we can offer at Montefiore? And, you know, what is it we have here besides having a great heart failure team um, and a good structural team? What can we offer your patients? So these are the studies we have running this year for the tricuspid valve in Monte. Uh, we do have, we are part of the Triluminate randomized study that will be randomizing patients either to a clip or medical therapy. I like to call the study the co-apt of the tricuspid valve because it will help us understand um, really what, do these transcatheter therapies impact mortality because mortality is part of the primary endpoint. Uh, we will have two different valves that can be placed via the, the femoral vein and we also will have the class, the Pascal device and uh, be part of a randomized study. So there are a number of different studies and devices that you can get your patient into. So I think you know, one of the mess final messages was, yes, at Monty, we will have devices, but I also wanted to share that you know, at Monty, we do have the expertise. Uh, I don't know if any of you have seen this website, but it's a worthwhile website to look at if you're trying to find an expert in the field. And so if you put in experts in tricuspid valves, you see that you know, most of them are in the United States, um, probably a lot of them in New York and some at Columbia, but you know, in New York, fortunately, we have two of the top uh, tricuspid valve experts in the world and one of them at Monty. So we can offer your patients devices, but we can off also offer them expertise. Thanks, Uli. I'm going to stop there for the sake of time. Yeah, that was, that was terrific. Um, of course, you don't tell me anything new about the, the number one tricuspid expert uh, being somewhere in New York. Um, very good. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, good. So, um, we have a couple of questions on the chat and then uh, we're going to, um, let's see. And I saw one from Drew. Okay, I'm just gonna read it out from Drew Crummerman. Uh, the septal aspect of the tricuspid valve shares real estate with the AV node, his bundle and right bundle branch. Can you comment on the incidence of AV block seen with implantation of some of these new devices? and also comment on difficulties crossing the tricuspid valve with pacer wires post uh, tricuspid valve repair. Yeah, those are great questions, Drew, um, and very important questions. So if you remember the picture I showed for the annuloplasty device, we try and spare the triangle of cock and stay far away from it because we don't want to cause AV block. Um, for the valves I showed you, I do think that the incidence of AV block will be higher than, say, using mitral clip on the tricuspid. 
Uh, there's no, in, there's almost a zero percent incidence of, of pacemaker for tricuspid clipping. But as we go to the valves, uh, there will be a higher incidence. Right now, it looks to be still single digits. Um, and I think part of it, because we are pressing on that area near the AV node, we're not actually putting sutures into it. And so that may spare us a little bit. Um, pacemakers, I saw there were two questions of pacemakers. Pacemakers, the, a couple of things in general about pacemakers. Once you have these devices in, uh, you can cross the device and put a lead across any of, of these devices without disturbing it. It has been done. In some cases, if it's been a fresh uh, implant, we've asked uh, EP to put maybe a coronary sinus or to put um, even a, a leadless pacemaker. Uh, so that's something we've done. The final issue is really pacemaker-induced TR, and I saw a question from Omar. Um, it's not a contraindication, absolutely, uh, Omar, to uh, treating this percutaneously, um, but we need to know whether the pacing lead, uh, where it is, right? So if the lead's free or sitting in a commissure, um, then we can, um, we can treat these patients. If the lead is um, really pushing on a leaflet and holding a leaflet open or stuck to a leaflet, it may be a challenge. Okay, terrific. Uh, we have uh, three more minutes. And uh, I think one of the slides you showed that uh, we try to find the patient at the point of no return. And again, I think the strength uh, of us here at Montefiore is that this is a team approach. And uh, Jennifer McLeod is one of the fellows. She's working with Sandhya Murthy. Sandhya, you all know, she directs pulmonary hypertension for cardiology and is on the eligibility committee of the uh, Triluminate study, actually. So if you want to bring a case, you have to first get by uh, Sandhya. And Jennifer, if you just want to go, uh, they're gonna sh she's just going to show uh, three slides on the treatment of uh, tricuspid regurgitation. That's the first thing the patient is going to go through if he comes to our team, medical therapy. Uh, Jennifer, are you on? Are you unmuted? Can you hear us and speak? I guess not. Okay, you need to unmute yourself. Yes, or I, am muted. I am muted. There? Yes, you can. Can you hear me now? Yes, go for it. Excellent. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Yorin. Thank you, Dr. Latif, for including me. I'm just going to briefly touch on um, secondary uh, TR, and particularly in pulmonary hypertension um, patients. This is a project I'm doing with um, one of my mentors, Dr. Murthy, here um, at Einstein. Um, so on the next slide, can I move forward? No, Azim, can you advance the slide? Yes. Okay, there you go. Great. So functional TR is a common finding, as you can expect, in pulmonary hypertension patients, and it's mainly a consequence of advancement in curricular remodeling. Um, there have been studies that are showing that um, TR progression in pulmonary arterial hypertension patients specifically is associated with progressive remodeling, which overall pretends for diagnosis in these patients. However, um, subsequent studies looking at these remodeling parameters, um, they have not been um, themselves been very good at predicting survival in these patients and seeing which ones um, have better survival in terms of if they have less remodeling. Um, on this slide here in particular, on the graph on the bottom right, um, a circulation published a study that kind of demonstrated this, um, that they saw that regardless of RV remodeling, um, these patients had very poor survival. Um, and in this graph, um, they actually stratified pulmonary hypertension patients who had functional PR, and about 20% of them were severe. And even stratifying patients and those who had normal severity, overall, patients had very poor survival. So when thinking about this, um, maybe TR might be, since it's showing that progression of TR might impact RB remodeling, maybe it might be a good idea of looking at the TR itself and seeing what impacts this overall. So on the next slide. Can move forward, Dr. Yeah. Latif? There you go. Great, thank you. Um, there has actually been recent focus of, as Dr. Latif is uh, mentioning, looking at TR itself and better trying to classify this amongst our patients. Um, and uh, towards the right of this 
uh, sorry, on the left of this screen. Um, and this has basically been taken from the ASC guidelines of how we traditionally classify TR in terms of mild, moderate, severe. Um, but um, uh, out of one of the uh, experts on TR out of here in Columbia, Dr. Rebecca Hahn, she actually proposed a recent grading scheme to actually better quantify these patients um, and seeing it's more complicated than just these three categories. Maybe um, you might expand it even to massive and torrential, um, which can better um, characterize particularly these pulmonary hypertension patients who can have very raging TR um, and to better be able to stratify them and be able to look at them individually instead of clumping, clumping a large amount of them in severe. Um, and so it could be very helpful and useful in pulmonary hypertension to really push the, um, to really um, better be able to categorize the TR in these patients and how it relates to remodeling. So um, just an example of how we're looking at that in the next slide. If you play the videos, it's going to play briefly, but this is just an example of a patient um, on the left. Um, she had both of these you would initially, if it plays, I hope it plays well, but both of these patients would first look- Can you see it? I can see them. Yep. Sorry, it might be a little choppy, but both of these patients, you traditionally would call, classify them as severe. But um, um, actually, uh, if you kind of use the new grading system, um, on the left it is showing this is a pulmonary hypertension patient who has maybe even on the new grading system might even be torrential TR. Um, but after being on pulmonary vasodilator therapy for even less than three months, if you look at her TR on the right, it actually is less. And on the new grading scale, it might actually be in the severe category. And she also has some parameters of her RV might have been um, reverse remodeling. And so maybe what is kind of driving that um, improvement in that TR, is it the remodeling? Is there other parameters of the RV or the patient itself, which is driving the um, improvement in the TR. That's kind of a question we want to look at since TR itself portends a poor prognosis in these patients. So on the next slide. So just briefly, um, so this is a study that I'm looking at with Dr. Murphy. We want to um, look at the structural and functional param uh, predictors of TR regression after initiating pulmonary um, PAH directed therapy in these patients. Um, so, so far we have about a good group of uh, 30 patients who have been defined as um, group one pulmonary arterial hypertension and we have pre and post echoes right before and after initiating, well not right before, but a good a little about median is like six months uh, to a year after starting therapy and then before, and we want to um, be able to classify this TR, hopefully using a new proposed grading system and then observe either through patient demographics, the therapy, hemodynamics, and even RV parameters to see what impacts the, um, what kind of predicts those patients to TR actually improves. Um, so, um, and because if we do see that um, some, there might be a predictor and if TR itself might be kind of a target um, that we could use for these patients, either um, it might suggest that it, we should maybe try to focus efforts either medically or maybe even interventionally or procedurally, as Dr. Lativa is mentioning, um, as a way to intervene um, in these high risk patients. So once we kind of get more results and um, formulate that, I would be glad to um, share it in hopefully another future Heart Failure Journal Club meeting. It really, you know, I think this highlights the importance of really working as a team for these patients because there are a couple of areas for those of us working in the tricuspid field where we're still struggling a lot. Um, and one of those areas is really the patients with severe pulmonary hypertension. You know, is there a level of severe pulmonary hypertension where it's futile doing anything to the tricuspid valve? And then also, you know, what is the role of treating these patients pharmacologically first, dropping their pulmonary pressures, and then possibly treating them with a transcatheter therapy? So I think there's a lot to learn there. Exactly. So I'm looking forward to once we get more results on this project. Um, I'm really excited to see what we might be able to discover um, through this. So I'm just looking forward to it. Yeah. Oli, did you have any comments? Are you coming to see? I've tried to answer the questions. There was one last question on Jonathan Curio. 
uh, yes. about triluminate as a tricuspid cord in mind. Should we adapt learnings, uh, coib learnings to TR? So only intervening in disproportionately severe TR. You know, fortunately, we haven't had that problem, uh, Jonathan, with TR. The patients, when they get referred to us for therapies, all have, you know, this torrential TR um, that um, you see in this new classification. It's actually, you know, I wish it was, that was a problem um, because it would mean that we're being referred fit patients early enough. Uh, but right <laughs> now, it isn't. Uli, maybe some final comments and yeah. we'll close up for the yeah, I was, yeah, if you can hear me, I was struggling with the mute button. No, I think that is a terrific question. Uh, and we'll figure out. Yeah, look for TR and send uh, the patients uh, to be evaluated, you know, either to the heart failure group or directly to the uh, to Azim. Uh, and uh, the triluminate study, maybe last thing, Azim, when do you think we will be operational? Um, are we operational except for well, COVID restrictions? Well, we'll probably by the time the COVID restrictions are over, we'll be operational. Um, the study has been approved. Uh, you know, all the, the first three studies I showed you have all been approved by our IRB. Um, we're just trying to finalize contracts and so on. And, all, and as you know, when you start talking about money, it always gets a little bit longer, a little bit more complicated. <laughs> okay. Okay. Very good. Um, thanks, everybody, for joining us. Uh, next week, we have uh, actually a case um, of COVID myocarditis that is extremely uh, educational and we will have a multidisciplinary uh, panel uh, discussing the case. Um, but we'll send out the announcement later in the week. So thanks everybody for joining. Thanks Jennifer and Sandy, a great job. Um, see you or hear you next week. Great, thanks, thanks all. Enjoy the rest of your week.